In the last video, we spoke about gene length, which I've been denoting as ELB sub i. Specifically, we talked about effective length, which is calculated as the gene length L sub i minus the mean fragment length distribution plus one. We spoke a lot about this mean fragment length and how it relates to effective length and what those quantities represent within an RNA sequencing experiment. But there are still unanswered questions about that last value, that last variable in the equation. Well, well not one, since one is a constant, but L sub i what is referred to as the gene length. And it represents the length of a gene. We have to make a couple of biological assumptions first about our RNA sequencing experiment. First, that we're using a pull-down method such as poly-A that is only going to leave mature transcripts. Mature mRNA, mRNA transcripts, just mature transcripts in general which means that these have undergone the alternative splicing process. The alternative splicing process. Which means that we can safely assume there are no introns present within these transcripts that are being sequenced. That leaves another question. Okay, now we know there are no introns so we can sort of calculated, but if we have a gene such as GM30604, this hypothetical murine treat gene, if we have a gene with multiple transcripts, in this case there are five different transcripts, how do we know which one is the right one? Or which one is the right length for our gene length? If we knew which one was the right length, then if we knew which one was expressed or which one was functional in our given hypothesis, that would be very helpful. That would be great. But oftentimes, that information is not readily available and would require much further experimentation in order to figure out. And at that point, you might as well not have been doing a overview, this kind of branching overview RNA sequencing experiment you would have done something a lot more specific to your gene of interest. So on the whole, holistically, it's very hard to tell which transcript exactly is the one that's being expressed, given a single end or even a paired end fragment, because the fragment maps to this location, for example, then there are three possible transcripts that it could align to. Or if it's mapped to the end or the beginning of these transcripts, it could map to all five of them, which is why this is also an expression of the challenge with transcript level alignment in and of itself. But then the question is, what should be fair game? Well, there's a lot of different ways that people calculate these gene lengths. First is to say, okay, I have five transcripts with five different lengths, Strategy one, I'll just take the mean of those. And if you take the mean, and then the mean gene length, that's what I define. The mean of these five transcripts, the mean transcript length for available transcripts, that's going to be my estimated gene length. The second option is similar to the first. It's the median. And the median gene length, I'll just take the median, maybe a little bit more resistant to outlier transcripts that may exist. You know, if you had one long one and four short ones, your median would be shorter than your mean. Makes sense. Another option is to simply look at the maximum length. And the maximum length, you take a look at the five transcripts, you compare all the lengths, which one is the longest transcript of this gene. And that will then be our gene length. And the reason why this one is more often selected, well, is the reason why the fourth one, the most popular strategy, is the one implemented by many quantification algorithms, algorithms that take alignment results from reference-based 
aligners and quantify them, assign genes. The reason why they calculate gene length this way, this is the most popular way of calculating gene length. That would be a kind of union of the exons, i.e. you look at all of the different exons, exonic regions, so wherever one transcript has an exonic region, you will count that as a part of potential length. So this we'll call the length of merged exons, because you can imagine collapsing all of the exons into one longer transcript, one longer gene. And so this would always get you the longest gene length for a given result. And why is the longest gene length considered to be the most appropriate? Well, in the calculations for FPKM or TPM, it's the most conservative in that when you have the longest gene length, the length correction is going to be least. And when you don't know exactly which transcript is being expressed within a given cell, or you can't tell based on where the fragments are aligning, when it's very difficult to tell, then it makes sense just to assume that everything is fair game. And that's why the maximum is also a popular method, because it follows the same reasoning that as the length of the merged exons strategy does. So to try and make the fourth one, this union or the length of the merged exons, a little bit clear, will Look at an example. Based on if you hover your mouse, this this is this scroll bar is from the for GM30604 is from the RefSeq interface, which is available from the NCBI database. If you go in and you look at RefSeq, you can look at any gene and you see this track. You can hover over one of the transcripts. And it will tell you that the entire length within the genome from this starting position, which I'll just mark in red, to this ending position, the length of this entire stretch is 7,799 nucleotides. Perfect. That's our starting point. This is our maximum length of merged exons. And if we had exons along every part of the track, then our length, our ultimate length of merged exons, our gene length, would be that 7,799. But it's not. There are places where introns exist, and these introns exist for every single transcript of the given gene. And so in order to calculate the gene length, we need to take the total length and subtract all of the different places, all of the different introns that exist for every single transcript. Because we know that in the alternative splicing process, all of those will always be cut out for this gene. We can do that one at a time. So this first intron here is 645 nucleotides you would see that within the RefSeq track by hovering over this intron. So we can subtract that, 645 nucleotides. We can see that there's a second piece here and subtract that, that's 253 nucleotides. We can see here there are some introns for transcripts 1 and 2, what I would just colloquially call transcripts 1 and 2, but since there are exonic regions here, we don't have to cut anything out. The next place where an only intron exists would be here. This is 1,059 nucleotides. So we subtract that out as well. Then we see here, there's another long stretch. This is 1,912 1, nucleotides. So we subtract that out. And then we see there's this region where there are sort of two kinds of introns. They seem to sort of overlap. 
it's kind of hard to figure out exactly which one to pick, but the right answer is to pick the shorter one, which would be 442 nucleotides. This is because even though this other one, which happens to be 451 nucleotides, even though this sort of cuts in here, these other, into this transcript specifically, these other four, these other four exons cover this nine nucleotide region. So that's why we use the shorter one. So we subtract 442 nucleotides, and I believe that the length, the length of the merged exons for this gene is 3,488 nucleotides. And this happens to be actually the same 3,488 nucleotides as, which is the length of the maximum isoform, the transcript that has the longest length happens to have the same length as the length of the merged exons, which, while often the case, is not always the case. For example, if the ice transcript at the top, which is, of course, the shortest by far, had an additional exon spanning, you know, off the page here, and the other four had introns, this would ultimately be included in the length for our merged exons while not being included in the maximum length. Thank you for listening.